So this is a map showing, um, again, this is that upper part of the Chesapeake Bay. This is the Susquehanna River coming down. It's the Conowingo Dam, for those of you guys who might have been up there. It's a fantastic place to watch eagles. Um, so we know um, that back in the 1980s, um, using a, a radio transmitters, they were able to document 17 communal roofs. Remember, the population wasn't uh, you know, enormous back then. But with our satellite transmitter data, we found 170, so a tenfold increase. So while it's really, really cool to see all that, um, it's not very easy to manage all of those roofs because a lot of them are on private property. Um, but it's also, it's not that surprising that the number of roofs have increased because it's also uh, the, reflecting the number of eagles that have increased in the population. So it just makes sense that they also have to have a place to go. And so when you start to look at the roofs on the landscape, you have to determine, okay, so you have 170 roofs. We can't put all our effort into saving 170 roofs. We're going to have to see if there's some variation. Maybe there's some that are more important. So we started looking at which roofs were used more than others. And we found there's um, one here at the Conowingo Dam, which is just absolutely fantastic. I think I saw you, Shelly, nod your head if you've been up there. Um, if you go there in, uh, in the evening, you can watch a couple hundred eagles flying into this roost. And it's just wow. fantastic. Um, you're in a, you know, a public park and you can sit on a, on a bench and just watch them all fly in. It's, it's just really uh, amazing to see. So these larger squares here are representing uh, the roofs that are hosting the most birds. So what we're proposing is if you can protect those large roofs, then you're going to protect the most number of birds. And we see that on this graph, that the top 10% of the roofs, so the roofs that are hosting the top um, 10 largest roofs, the top, I can't phrase that right, but anyway, the top 10% of, of roofs here, <clears throat> if you can protect those, you're going to protect um, over 50% of the roosting population. Um, and these are um, supporting here, this one right here is the, the Conwingo Dam. Actually, I'm sorry, this one of the arrows on is the Conwingo Dam. And so we also did this exercise to see, okay, if we have one transmitter bird, how long would it take us to find all these roots just following the, the tracking data? So how long would it take us? Um, and as we started deploying more and more transmitters here, so this is the first transmitter we deployed, keeps going here in red. Over time, we start deploying more and more transmitters, and it took us almost a year um, to discover the, all the 170 roots. So one bird may not use all 170 roofs on the landscape. So you really need a large group of transmitters out there, um, basically these probes that are going out and finding the roofs for you and highlighting them on the landscape, um, which is actually a very expensive um, type of project to have to pull off um, to, to put that many transmitters on. Um, but maybe over time, maybe 10 years, you might be able to find um, all roofs so this is an example of that, um, that same study area. Everything in blue dots, those are the communal roofs. Um, and the lines, these colored lines, is yellow, red, orange, green, and purple, these represent movements of one bird, one uh, recently fledged chick, that is just starting to learn the roofs. So these roofs are already out there. He's just left the nest, and he's starting to find the roofs. And what's interesting is that he's, in one day, he's going from this yellow one, he's going here. He's using three roofs. So it goes back to that social interaction, that learning uh, that they're using these roofs for. Here, in one day, he's found four different roofs here in purple. Um, so that's it's been pretty interesting to see how these roofs are actually um, benefiting these chicks. So over time, this is about a year's worth of data. The bird is just continuing to move between roofs. And so those places are ones you know, ones that he's finding other eagles, starting to learn the resources on the landscape. And then if you zoom out and you look at how this bird is now using the upper Chesapeake Bay, 
right here, this is where the Susquehanna comes down into the bay. And the bird is just bouncing between roofs over and over and over again. So they're, they're providing a really important resource for these birds. So this is an azalea, I think it's a pretty recent photo, right? Last week. Um, so we've been looking at um, how these, uh, these tracking data can tell us about nest territories um, and, and how the nesting uh, birds can, are moving around the landscape. Are they staying in the territory year-round? Um, we're finding that they're doing these exploratory flights. And it's been really interesting. We're also looking at the shoreline data in these concentration areas and trying to understand how the birds are actually using that shoreline. Um, and that's been really important for management. And then also um, identifying communal roosts and understanding how the birds are using those roosts. So some of the things that we're looking at for the future, um, I think these are, this is all data from the botanical gardens, right? Which bird was this? Is this Azalea that was at the, or, no, it was Camellia that was at the landfills. Camellia spent most of the time in the landfills, and Azalea at the fish farm. Right. So this is Camellia's hanging out of the landfill, uh, which is not uncommon. When I worked in Florida, we probably had at least half of our birds hanging out at the landfills. Some actually did not migrate at all and just hung out at the landfills right after they fledged. So they found a um, quick, quick snack. Um, so we're looking at, um, you know, more research on airport collisions and um, how to avoid those. Uh, the birds here at the Botanical Gardens are definitely not the only eagles that are using airports um, as landing zones. Um, and then we have uh, some really interesting uh, behavior here where I think there's a, at least one communal roost, Reese, right, that's, um, that's around this foraging area. So it's a great example of you got a, a place that the birds are foraging, so it makes sense that they've also got to have a retreat, a place to go um, and roost at night. Thankfully, this particular aquaculture site, um, they like eagles, and I think it's a federal site, isn't it? State. State. North Carolina. So uh, it's protected, but it's, uh, they're not always welcomed. Um, <laughs> you do hear about birds that get shot, um, and uh, it's definitely unfortunate. So our research so far has been focusing on um, both breeding and non-breeding eagles, and uh, now we're starting to look at how the intruders are, are moving on the landscape. Um, and part of the video project that we're doing this year on the James River, um, we're looking at how intruders are coming into nests um, and disrupting breeding activity um, in these concentration areas. So our transmitter data is playing into that. And then we're also looking at how telemetry is um, uh, it's giving us a, a better understanding of the migrants and how they're playing into the, the whole dynamics of the population here in the Bay. I think that's it. Yeah, that's the last slide. So if you guys have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. How are you determining that a frequented spot is a roost? Does it take more than one? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's not defined in the literature. Uh, so what we've done, actually I say until we just published something this past month on it, um, what we've done is one bird can tell us that it's a roost if that bird like Azalea has gone there over and over and over and over. Um, the other key is if we see more than one bird going to that same area. Um, and a lot of times, uh, we've gone in and just ground truth. We've actually physically gone to the site like Reese has done. Um, we go to the site and we look to see if that transmitter data um, makes sense. If we're seeing lots of signs of eagles in that place, if we're seeing lots of whitewash um, on the ground and lots of molted eagle feathers and pellets, things like that, that tell us that it is a roost. And so that's confirmed for us that that transmitter data is actually telling us what um, identifying a particular roost. And in the upper bay area that you're mostly studying, do those roosts maintain themselves all year long? They do. Um, the ones that are on the shoreline, it's a good, good question. The ones that are right on the shoreline that are exposed uh, to the winter winds and the snow and stuff, um, those seem to taper off when they're not used in the wintertime. Um, the birds are moving farther inland. Um, but the ones that are, the roosts that are inland are used year round. Yeah. Each 
how long do you get information from them year-wise, and do they stay attached to that? Sure, good question. So the question was, I um, forgot I was supposed to say the question out loud. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the transmitters are staying on the birds um, basically for life. Um, but the transmitters, the battery, will go forever. So they're solar powered, um, and we have yet to have one fail. Um, the battery fail or anything on it. So um, the birds that we put the transmitters on in uh, five years ago are still going strong. So we expect them to continue. Um, I also will say that we have, so we've lost about half of our transmitters. Um, when I say lost, they, they're no longer transmitting. Um, so around about 15 of those, the birds actually removed themselves. So I went in and recovered the transmitter on the ground and they're actually cut. The birds slice them off with their bills and they take the harness off. So, so I like to say that, that the transmitters are only on as long as they will tolerate them. Um, and some birds, you know, I don't know if it's personality or what, they, you know, they're fine with them. And it doesn't seem to matter if it's an adult or a juvenile or a nestling. Um, so I'm just take them off. Um, the other half of the ones that I recovered were actually on dead birds. Um, that were killed or electrocuted. Yes. How many total transmitters? How many total transmitters have you attached to birds over your study period? Um, to eagles? Yes. Um, so the question is, how many uh, transmitters have we attached to eagles? Um, we've done um, in this particular study in the Chesapeake Bay about. 70 total. Um, Reese and I are going to put on another one this week, and then I've got two more in the Upper Bay up in uh, Pennsylvania that I'll be doing next week. Um, and, you know, there's still a very strong interest in continuing the research because we're learning so much about how the eagles are moving, so we anticipate continuing to put a couple out every year. Okay, welcome. Okay, last question. Could you um, count your most, what you learned that was most interesting? Since you've been doing transmits on people's yeah, um, river day. I think I want to say that the botanical the, the gardens in particular, well, one, one thing, when you work with any species, there's never a time that you know everything. I mean, as much as you think you know, you really don't. Um, and I think that the, the nest here has really uh, continued to challenge us in so many ways, um, so many different management problems. Um, problems, challenges, um, <laughs> but also just the really unique things that we've been able to understand with uh, video cameras that, you know, as a researcher, I only see eagles, you know, for snapshots in time. I'm not watching them 24 hours a day like a lot of you guys are. And, so the, and, I, and I see that. I mean, you guys are providing a totally different experience um, and supporting us in different ways, you know, where Reese is able to say, wow, check this out, you know, I was on it five in the morning and I saw the bird bring in this wood duck or something and you know things that we would have never known um, just because of the way we do our research and, and the types of things we're looking for. Um, so you know I, I think that you know it's been really special to be able to work here um, and work with this pair and work with Reese um, and just be able to, to get a different glimpse at eagles through the Botanic Garden Fest. Thank you. In five minutes, you don't want to be late. This is uh, Libby and Reese. Um, do you guys mind if I post your presentations on YouTube? Yes, that's fine. Reese, okay? Yep. Thank you. <laughs>